This meeting is being recorded. Members of the public wishing to participate in the meeting must use their full names for Zoom access. If full names are not used, people will not be allowed to participate in discussion. The town reserves the right to remove any member of the public from the meeting who doesn't use their full name or acts inappropriately. As a primary matter, this is the vice chair of the Council on Aging. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on this agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Erin? Here. Laura? I guess your staff. Here. Nancy? Here. Arlene? Here. <clears throat> Jude? Is Jude there? She is there. I can see her. No. In the and she did just unmute herself. Jude, can you hear us? I didn't understand what she said. There she goes. You there, Jude? Jude, if you can, you can type into chat at the bottom of the screen there. Just click on the chat and just type hello. That should count or present. Okay. Ah, okay, yeah, she is reporting that she is in attendance. Yeah. Okay. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Laura? Here. Jericho? Here. Anticipated, anticipated speakers on the agenda. Jason? Hi there. Here. Okay. Good afternoon. This open meeting of the Council on Aging is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless participate, such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For the meeting, the Council on Aging is convening by video conferencing very video via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to share, screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noticed. The public, uh, I, the vice chair notes otherwise, unless I, the vice chair notes otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I, the vice chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude the remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold, your, hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking, and please remember to speak clearly in a way that generates accurate minutes. For any response, please wait till the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking time care to, event, to identify yourselves. For items with pu public content, all members have sp when all members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. 
Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call. Okay. Bob, uh, just as a point of order, we had two people join, one of whom is Abby Camp, um, and the other is uh, iPhone. Um, would you mind, iPhone, to just uh, either identify yourself or type your name in uh, to the, um, your name? You can right click on rename. Welcome, Abby. Uh, hello, whoever is, is in here as iPhone, would you mind uh, identifying yourself? Sorry, to make it sound so official. Maybe it's Linda. I don't believe Linda has an iPhone. Okay. Oh, well, true. Sure. <laughs> uh, okay, regardless, uh, we can move on. Okay, I believe the first uh, uh, agenda item is to approve the agenda. Would someone like to move that? So move. Is there a second? I second, Nancy. Okay. Um, Air, uh, we have to take a vote. Aaron, yes or no? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Arlene? Yes. Um, Jude, Jude says yes in her in her chat. Okay, and the other person on is who's who is the I? Abby. Okay, is connecting, and we don't know who iPhone is. Okay. We also need to approve the minutes from the December 6, 2022 meeting and the February 1st, 2023 meeting. There was no January meeting. Can we have a motion to approve those minutes? Bob, before we approve, may I make a recommendation? I was, sure. at, I was at the February 1st meeting. I did come in late. However, my name is not on the attendees. So if we could add my name to it for February 1, that would be good. So noted. Okay. Um, so we have, do we have a motion to adopt the minutes? I'll make a motion to adopt, Nancy. Okay. Will somebody second? I second. Okay. Roll call. Aaron? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Arlene? Yes. Phoebe? No. Who is that? Abby. Abby, I'm sorry. sorry. Jude? Oh, Jude, is, is Jude not in your head? Uh, we lost it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I approve. Okay, um, I'm very pleased that uh, we have as a guest speaker today, Jess, Jason Bridges, who's the executive director of Fairwinds. And Fairwinds is doing some very interesting uh, programming and new initiatives in mental health. And I invited Jason to join us to talk about some of these new initiatives and how they might be pertinent to the senior community on the island. So Jason, thank you for being with us and take it away. Thanks for having me, Bob. And I, for almost two years, I did that whole roll call thing in the beginning. It's, uh, so you did a great job. <clears throat> so Fairwinds, what, what are we up to now? I'll try to give you a general, um, some of the, the new initiatives and the increase in service and access that, that's happened in the last, uh, it, it's definitely accelerated in the last three months uh, since January 3rd, because we took over a lot of different things. Really, the last six months we've been um, kind of gearing up for this. So, um, when I first got here in September of 2021, we had one prescriber, one one our, our medical director, Dr. Maxwell, and it was it was a four to five month waiting list to get in to get a med intake for him to even get you into his you know weekly or monthly 
uh, rotation. So in five months was was a good thing. But when you hear that, most people go somewhere else. So really, it was maxed out. And then we got Joy Brown, a psych MP, to come on board for a full day. And that got our med management down to almost a week. It was pretty much no waiting list. And that was a huge win. Now, I'll just, I'll just start with prescribers and med management. That's the kind of the biggest leap that we've taken. Now we have five prescribers. We have another doctor who lives here uh, year round who's working uh, a full day. I think it's Monday and then a couple of days on Sundays. Uh, a couple hours, a couple shifts on, on Sundays, which is great. So if there's a mental health crisis on Friday night or Saturday night, whether it's in the community or at the hospital, we can get them in to see a prescriber the next morning. Uh, we also hired another psych MP who works uh, Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 12.30. And we have a minimum two slots that are open. So anytime there's an emergency or a crisis, which we took over January 3rd, all mental health crisis goes through Fairwinds, whether it's at the, the emergency room, whether it's at, it doesn't matter, our island home, anywhere in the community and at Fairwinds, we respond. And our, our response time has been around 15 minutes, which is, you can't do that in Boston or outside, right? You got to drive a while, but because it's so small, we get there pretty fast. Um, so one of the great things about having the, all these prescribers is that we can stabilize faster. And so people aren't boarding in the in the ERs if they don't need to, right? We can get them out of the, we stabilize them in the ER, a crisis clinician goes and, and sees them or at their house or here. And then the next, the same day or the next day, we can see, a psychiatrist or a psych MP. And then we can get them into urgent care. Our urgent care used to be 5 p.m. every day, one hour each day, where somebody could come in and just see a therapist. Like they just couldn't wait to get in, whether they're an existing client or it, you know, someone we've never met before. And now we have two. We have nine o'clock and five o'clock, but our crisis clinicians can, can do an urgent care intake at any time of the day if they're not in a crisis. So we've, we're a little flexible there. So really we're it's almost any time we can do urgent care. And so taking over crisis, having all these pre these prescribers, um, having all this availability has really allowed us to stabilize. Uh, some people still need to go off island for, for a higher level of care, inpatient psych, detox, and, and um, sometimes that goes around the hospital, sometimes it goes through the ER. Uh, we're, we're trying to um, divert as many people from the ER as possible. Now, of course, if they have SI or there's, there's medical issues, then they have to go to the ER. But what we're finding is there's a lot of people going to the ER that, that doesn't need to go there. But that was kind of the only game in town when we used to have a fragmented crisis system. So uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the, the relationship building that, that has happened in the last year. And it, there's a lot of different reasons for it. Um, we are, uh, it's not a grant, it's a contract. So um, Mass Health in the state is centralizing all behavioral health through Mass Health and the uninsured. And all these different areas had to apply for it. So we applied for it on Nantucket and we got the contract. A lot of people think it's a grant, like we got all this money. We didn't. We got higher reimbursement rates in some areas for Mass Health. And for that, we have to take over crisis. We have to be open on well, eight o'clock at night. We have to be open on Saturday and Sunday. All these kind of mandates, which are all really good mandates, uh, come along with it. So there's a little more reimbursement, a little more revenue stream, but then you have to do all these things that are really, really difficult. For example, we have a 24 seven site consult on call 365 days a year where our clinicians or the ER docs can call a psychiatrist or psych MP, our, uh, her name's Amy, um, and get a consult. That's really, really, really powerful and helpful to get a, to get a medical advice during a crisis um, situation. So all these things have um, kind of pushed into, we, we are, it's called the CBHC, the Community Behavioral Health Center. We are that for Nantucket, and that's driven a lot of this. We kind of got pulled into it, uh, but, but we had to apply for it. It was, uh, I should go get it. It's like a stack, it's like this big, it's great. It's, uh, it took us four months to write and to propose. So that's, that, that's, I try to tell that story as short as possible so you can ask questions. But on the relationship side, um, I go back to when I got here about a year and a half ago. You know, we talked to the police a little bit, the first responders, but there, there wasn't a lot of back and forth. Now we meet with the police and fire. And now dispatch, we found dispatch is, was the missing link 
to handling crisis that they deal with. And we meet with them once a month. And we, we're pro and we're figuring it out as we go. We're problem solving. We're working on a proactive wellness plan where a clinician can once a week for four hours, two hours, start off small and go proactively. Um, like their sergeant would, one of the sergeants would go and they'd look at their call sheet for the week and say, all right, let's check on this person, this person, this person. And a plain clothes officer and a clinician, they would go in and check in. So there's things like that that we're working on. Um, we're working with Fairgrounds House. They know all about our crisis. We've been over there a couple of times. And recently we worked with our island home. We had our medical director, another prescriber, our clinical director, myself, Dr. Kame, um, and a couple others from o OIH to figure out how we can help more now. Now that we have all these prescribers, what's the workflow? How do we how do we do it better? Um, and, and there's different challenges there, right, with dementia and and geriatric. So we, we're we're on a much better plan to be able to help, and we have actually have the people and the staff to do it. So that's really exciting. Uh, and that happened just a couple of weeks ago. So the things would take a couple of months for us to kind of work out some of those things. So um, hospital is great. We're contracted to go in there and do all the crisis in the ER. That took a couple of months to figure that contract out. You can imagine with the hospital and MGB trying to uh, figure all that onboarding. They, of course, of course have different uh, EMR, emergency medical record system than, than we do. So it's a little tricky, but we've got to figure it out and we're there. I would say the schools are working with really well. We support them. Uh, some of our clinicians do some 30 minute kind of therapy um, sessions with some of our high schoolers, you know, once a day. So we, we try to support the school however they need us, right? They have all, they have their own social workers and their own programs. We just say, what would you like us to do? Um, I'm trying to think of some, kind of some of the main, uh, the, the big thing is everybody's talking. Addiction solutions is another one. We had a case a couple of weeks ago. I'll try to use some stories where it was a very, very difficult situation. We had the ER doc, ER nurse, clinical director from Fairwinds, the clinician and Dr. Lepery meeting in the same room talking about one client. Like that, that is monumental that that happens. Really amazing. And so those are like the little things that are starting to happen that Fairwinds is leading a lot of it, but there's no way we could do it without all the different stakeholders uh, involved. So um, there's a behavioral health initiative that's been going on for a couple of years where this group, these the stakeholders in behavioral health have been working together. That's been a big part of it. Uh, but, but I'll stop there if you guys have any questions. That was a mouthful. Uh, does anyone have some questions for Jason? Why don't you raise your hand? Abby? Yes, did you sorry. Yes, I uh, was having technical difficulties, and I'm so sorry, but um, Jason, I'm sure you don't have to repeat. What you I'll did. repeat it all. You guys got to listen. <laughs> but I couldn't get in, but now I'm listening. <laughs> so, Jason, um, I've been working along with you on the um, the behavioral health initiative. So I've gotten some updates on the um, the CBHC model. But I know that when we were originally coming in to working on the behavioral health initiative, one of the big um, gaps or or problems with people on a ground level was that they they didn't know who to call or con contact in order to get help on, a, on an emergent basis. So this new revision of the like the centralized one-stop shop for behavioral health stuff, that means so that you there's one line to call, there's one organization to call, and then you guys reach out from there to connect to other to, to, to connect patients to whatever resources are necessary. Yeah, I mean the mental health hotline, there's a, a clinician has that 24-7. So when they call that every once in a while, it won't be won't be for us and we'll just refer them. But um, our system in our phone is we can actually transfer them to wherever they need to go. So they don't have to drop the line and go somewhere. Uh, for, but most of them, we, we go and, and do an assessment and people are, are starting to understand that crisis don't have to be at the most acute level. Like you can call us before it gets to this really you know challenging time, right? We can go and assess and Businesses are starting to call us. Some of our larger businesses, they, I actually got a call uh, last week. Uh, kind of a friend of mine said, hey, this happened at our place of work. What do I do? Like, here's the situation. I said, call the mental health hotline. We'll go and assess, and then we can 
you know, we can triage it from there. And sometimes we might say, yeah, you need to go to the ER. Of course, we will go through and like, is, is, is there a medical issue? But if people don't call us and say they call the police, that's the part that we're working on with dispatch and police where they know just to send them right over to us or they got a section, they got to say, all right, this emergency and ambulance is coming. And that, that's the stuff that wasn't happening before. Because I did, not to get into it, but crisis used to be fragmented. So if you had mass health or uninsured, you had to call Gosnold. If you had commercial insurance, you had to go to the hospital. But if you didn't know, you called somebody, they'd have to ask you in the middle of a crisis, well, what insurance do you have? So they knew who could help you. And that, that has now been removed. And it's just us. And then Fairlands will, you know, will um, refer you on to someone else if it's not needed. Um, Jason, um, yep. or Arlene here. Um, so what about, so I'm a little, I'm still a little confused. What about um, NAMI and Gosnold and all the other organizations that were out there doing, you know, the mental health counseling? Are they merging under your umbrella now? Is that? No, no. Gosnold, no? Is, a, Gosnold is a huge company, Yeah, that's what right? I thought. 30 yeah. million, and they do 98% of their work on the Cape. Right, they have okay. mm -hmm. co-occurring co bed facilities and detox. We send almost everybody to detox to to, to Gosnold, and they're doing so programs. They're they're still here doing lo lots of programs. Um, they just they did not get the crisis contract because we were awarded the CVHC when the crisis came with that. So I, that's just a little bit of a shift of who's doing what. Um, and NAMI is still on it. They're not a provider. NAMI is more of an educator advocate. But, but you know they work with hotlines. You can call NAMI, right, and they can get you where where they where you need to go. Uh, and they do some funding for private practitioners, so they get funding to those private practitioners that okay. normally wouldn't see somebody that's uninsured. Okay, I never, I didn't know that. that, like, yep. that thank you for yep. defining all of that. Yeah. Oh. Yep. And we work we work with them. Um, Gos, uh, Gosnold is um, still still here a little bit. I think they're. Mm -hmm. Just kind of ramp it up and doing some other things. So their 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 sweet spot is substance misuse, right? And, mm -hmm. and so we want them to be here. We want them to do as much as they possibly can here, right? And they can they do outpatient therapy and some other things that we do too. Like the more the merrier. Like the, the demand is there. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you when I got here, we were doing about 600 encounters. That could mean everything, right? Med management, outpatient therapy, counseling, uh, about 600 a month. And now we're doing about 1,800 a month. Hmm. And that's that's skyrocketing. It's probably going to be over two thousand because crisis is driving. You know, we see somebody and we say, "Look, here's all these options, right? Do you want to see urgent care? Do you want to see a clinician tomorrow, right? So now you've, you know, uh, you're in crisis. We stabilize. You see maybe a clinician. You see a, a prescriber, and then we get you in for maybe you know reoccurring or send you to some somewhere else. Whatever whatever you need. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Other questions for Jason? Anybody? No? Well, the one thing I'll, I'll just, while everybody's thinking of their other questions is we used to be only open nine to five. Now we're open eight to seven. And that sounds like not that, not that big of a deal. It's only three hours a day. Well, with, with the staffing challenges, it's really challenging. Uh, eventually we'll be open on Saturdays because not everybody can get to their appointments during the work the work week, right? Or they have to take their lunch or they have to, um, but having a prescriber, having Dr. Price available on Sundays has, has been huge because things happen on the weekends. And normally what would happen is if, if you have a mental health crisis on Friday, you gotta, you're boarding until Monday to, may, to maybe see someone, even if, you, if that even can happen. But that, that's now been kind of, that doesn't happen anymore. But I would say the, the biggest thing that I, I see is uh, everybody's talking. Every, right. Everybody's having these conversations and problem solving as we go to it's system level change. And this is a this you know crisis and, and um, the crisis response and then the stabilization that comes right after it were the two, I would say, biggest missing pieces. In, in, a, in, a, in a county, we're a county, right? We're the most under-resourced county in Massachusetts obvious because we have the you know 30 miles of water between us we don't you know I, I, it's, it's it's interacting with people 
don't know Nantucket, and they say, well, how do you, uh, oh, we interviewed somebody to, to work for us, and they said, what higher level of care facilities do you have uh, on Nantucket? <laughs> And it's like we don't have we don't have any right. It, you have to go off island. You have to, you know. So if, and they're like, whoa, wow, how do you do that? And this is what we're trying to figure out how to stabilize faster. Mm -hmm. Other the, the, I'm sorry, that's it. I'll keep talking. I'm done. Other questions for Jason? Anybody? Yeah, Jude, did you have your hand raised? I think you're silenced. You want to put it in the chat, June? And Abby, if you wanted to know more, I can, like you and I can connect up another time if you missed some of this. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, and no, this is um, really interesting. I, um, I, I just joined the Council on Aging. So does, how does this um, connect with Fairwinds? Is it, is it also, um, do you well, also take care of? Yeah, we see anybody. And oh, I think oh. us having uh, a better relationship and workflows at our island home, where our med management team and our, they have social workers there, but I think the med management piece is what is really missing in the workflow. So we, we had a meeting with our island home uh, and Dr. Kame and with, with all with our medical director and clinicians to figure out how we can do it better there what, so we what, what percentage are are is it um young people like 20s and 13s or that or is it how how many of the older people end up um having to be rehabilitated from over drug use or whatever um it's um it's i don't have the stats in front of me but it depends on what older people it is is it is it 65 and up or is it 55 and up jason 55 yeah 55 wow. and up so well young. if it's 55 and up it's probably 40 50 percent of our clients i would think probably oh. 40 percent i mean 55 and up yeah and then the other half is you know in the middle and then you have the, the kids and kids and families we always are about half of our our clientele but we just um started accepting medicare last year it was a uh, three to four year battle, maybe five years of the IRS was saying, uh, Medicare was asking for certain things that we didn't have, it didn't make sense. So we would go to IRS and they would, it was like this years of trying to figure it out. And so finally we went to our state senators then national senators to get it figured out. And we got it last year. So accepting Medicare has been amazing. Right, just really opened it up for so many people to come. Yeah, if you're on a fixed income, you can't. You can't afford this behavioral health or any medical care, really. And what Jason, uh, Jude has a question. What does HB, uh, CBHC yeah. stand for? Community Behavioral Health Center. So there's 25 CBHCs in Massachusetts, and they're, they're regionalizing all uh, behavioral health care, mass health, and uh, uninsured. But they're bringing in the commercial, like slowly over years. Uh, uh, you can still have a mental health clinic without being a CBHC, but they're at least mass health and uninsured will go through these CBHCs. And it's a work in progress. We, it took us, you know, like I said, three months to apply for it, four months to prepare for it with the state. And uh, it, it kind of gets better and better, um, you know, each month as, as we, we kind of figure all this out. And then, Jason, can I follow up on that? I, this is me getting to to pick your ear outside of an MBHI meeting, so I, I'm going to ask a bunch of these <laughs> things that have been burning questions for a couple months now. But um, so basically, the distinction between that CBHC and what was happening before is that everybody had a different part of the like a different piece of the the coverage, and no one was really communicating so the the functional difference now is there's one stop it's a one-stop shop for everything behavioral health right almost everything. yeah yes yeah. so it's centered around crisis and everything mass health right so all mass health goes through cbhcs but you could but they're not trying to stop you know hurt access they still want there's mm -hmm. other clinics like riverside has lots of clinics but only certain ones are cbhcs in certain areas so you cover a certain area 
right, for mass health and uninsured for outpatient and crisis. <laughs> so all the all the crisis is uh, that is completely controlled by CVHCs is the crisis. Nancy, did you have a question? Okay. Any other questions for Jason? I was curious about the um, when you said about fifty percent of your the people that you treat are over fifty five. What what is the is there um, something that is more prevalent than other like uh, drinking over pills or um, what what is the thing of the more of the older population that sort of stands out? Well, I just turned 47, so I feel like 55 is, uh, isn't old at all, but I, but I know what you're saying. Um, <laughs> uh, that, the, those, it, may, it might be 35%. I just don't have it in front of me. Like when you said right. 55, I was like, well, that's probably half. Uh, what we're seeing, I can tell you what we're seeing with kids, right? That has definitely increased. It started increasing before I got here during COVID. And um, there, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff, right? I mean, the, 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 the co-occurring, right, is the is the addiction, the use of substances with a mental health disorder, right? That, that is usually kind of what we're seeing uh, more and more. And it jumps up in October, November, mostly November, when there's a big change seasonally, temperature-wise, um, housing-wise, you know, light-wise. There's a huge uh, influx, and then it happens again. You wouldn't think this. This isn't actually your your question, Abby, but we see it again in April and May. Yeah. And you would think, like, oh, everybody should be happy. It's spring. It's lighter out. Jobs. It's change, and that you know the seasonal uh, disorders come out, and uh, so those two times we uh, are are ready, right? And then the holidays, but. I don't have anything uh, definite of, if, if, you know, people 55 and up, what are the, the main things? Like, that's the data that we have to do a better job of being able to, to grab that data and then put out. Um, I missed the first part and I wanted to know what, what, you, what the focus of this group is, what are you trying to do going forward? You know, what are the goals here? I mean, I, I think Bob brought me on to just talk about all these new services that anybody can use, but whether you're an elder or you have a six-year-old, um, things are different now. Like the, the, the mental health hotline, we just want people to call it. Just call it if there's a mental health, whether it's dementia or it's psychosis or an anxiety attack, we want people to call it and we will come to you to help. And if it's something that, is not a mental health crisis, then we will refer you, or, or we could say, won't you come in? We have urgent care coming in right now. You know, if it's something like, I'm not really feeling good today, but there's very, what we have found, and there's, there's, we've got, we've had calls where people just said, ah, you know, I just, something's not right, I'm off, I'm off, and then we take care of them, and they had a plan, and they had suicidal ideation, and they had a plan. So anybody calls it, we take it very seriously. And then we go, we go to them. And if we go to them and they don't need us, that's great. What? How great is that, right? We can just refer you to whatever else you needed. So I think that's really um, the, the crux of this is that we can get to people really fast. We can stabilize faster so they don't have to board in the ED. And we can di divert from the ED in, some, in certain situations. We haven't had that before, so it's new, Abby. You, you certainly hear about it a lot more. You see it in the paper and you hear people talking about fair winds is suddenly sort of on the map. So uh, you must be doing something right because um, word is well, out I, Thank you. I don't have any development staff, so I'm doing all those ads. So I'm glad somebody's seen them. That's good <laughs> feedback for me. <laughs> any other questions for Jason? Anybody before we let him go? No, no, but thank it's you. great to hear your story, Jason, and thank you for sharing all this information with us and the public at large. So great job. Keep it up. 
And yes, in Jason, addition, thank you for being with us. In addition, if anyone has any questions that come up later or anything that they'd like me to help find out for them, I can definitely um, forward stuff over to Jason for answers. Yeah, th thank you all. I mean, we're working really hard, but it's really been a community effort. Everybody's talking now, which is great. And the trust is there. So thank you all. Thanks, Bob, for inviting me. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, the next agenda item is we have two two new members, and uh, Aaron, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then Abby. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I look forward to being a part of the council and advocating for our Nantucket community. Um, my name is Aaron Lynch, and I have been a full time year round resident for seven years. My husband and I have a one-year-old and we're expecting in June, so it'll be a busy household. Um, I originally moved here to work at Our Island Home as the assistant administrator, and then I have since, for the past five years, been running a home care and care management business. Um, we serve the Nantucket community and we also have staff off-island as well. Um, right now, we employ three registered nurses an office manager and 40 aides. And we're always looking to add more to our team, especially when it comes to the aides. Um, some background, I went to undergrad for gerontology and I went uh, to grad school for gerontology and management. And I'm just looking forward to being a part of this team and continuing to advocate for our senior community. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And thank you. Thank you and welcome. Abby, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I've been a member of the community for about 35 years. I think I've moved down here um, from Boston. I, I actually lived in Greece for a very long time. Um, I, um, I'm on the HDC. Um, I've been on that for about 16 years. Um, and I, I'm very interested. I'm, so the reason I ran for council on the aging is that I'm, I'm 72 years old. Um, and um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm in good physical condition, but um, my friends have, um, you know, we're all sort of failing in one way or another. So I thought it would be uh, some, something I'm, I'm getting used to and uh, firsthand. And um, just very interested in helping out in the community. Well, whatever I can do, um, it's just it's um, be fun to be part of your team. Great, welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a big event coming up: the Senior Man and Senior Woman of the Year. And I believe Laura, you're going to take it and talk to us about it. Yes, uh, I believe I sent all the information out to everybody. It's just time to look at your timeline to see what needs to be done, when, and how we're gonna how you're gonna do it. Um, so the first thing is to send a press release to the INM, which Marianne will do. Uh, I will put it out on our newsletter. Uh, and I also made some posters, which I don't think I sent around to everybody that kind of look like this. And it has a little QR code that you can put your phone up to and it'll bring you right to the application and submit it right to me. So that's kind of cool. If anybody wants to come and pick some of those up and put them on only bulletin boards, you can't go around and put them on telephone poles and things like that. They have to be established bulletin boards. Uh, like at Stop and Shop or the doctor's office or something, or hand them out to your friends. Um, so we're going to do all the advertising and hopefully we will get some nominations. And when I get them, I will send them. I will just email them randomly. Last year, I think we had 30 or 40 of them. So it was a lot for you guys to read over. So once I get them, I'll send out a bunch at a time just so you can kind of read them at your leisure. Um, and you guys will be discussing it at your May meeting, picking a female and a male that have not been picked before. So that was one of the pieces of paper that I sent was the past recipients. They can't get it again. Um, and it explains everything of 
come in, what they need, uh, you know, to be 60 and older and um, represent, you know, outstanding seniors in the town. We really need to make sure that when people do send in their nominations, that they are very specific about what the seniors have done for volunteer or whatever. Um, it used to be that we would all know who those seniors were. Now we don't know who they are. So it's not like we can just say, oh yeah, I know that person. I know what they did, blah, blah, blah. Everybody needs to be specific. So if you could let people know that you're talking to, that that's really important because we would have to either not use that nomination or, you know, I have in the past said, can you give us a little more information? Um, what else? So then you guys will decide in May who it's going to be or who the two people are going to be. And then there'll be a luncheon, which has always been the fourth Thursday of June at the fairgrounds. And I've talked to Bill Puder. He said they're still going to be there. So I reserved that day. Uh, and then we will have a celebration lunch and um, have certificates from the town, certificates from the state, um, hopefully some select board members, all of you, Nantucket Center for Elder Affairs, who is the uh, fundraising arm of the Salt Marsh. They um, sponsor it, so they'll pay for the meals. Um, and I guess that's kind of it. So I just wanted you all to know kind of it's coming up and, you know, mm -hmm. I do most of the kind of paperwork and stuff to get all the information out there. But then you guys really need to read these and, you know, kind of have one or two on each side, male and female, of who you like. Um, mm -hmm. And when we do do it and it's recorded, we're going to I'm going to assign numbers to each person so the general public doesn't know who we're discussing. So that's so that's it. Anybody have any questions about any questions of Laura? What they need to do. Nancy? No, you're muted, Nancy. I'm muted. I'm unmute. Okay. Can we nominate somebody who was a previous NCOA board member? They're not currently one. Yeah. Is it okay to? Okay. As long as they're not currently on the Council on Aging. Good. Okay. And you can nominate people that have been nominated before that haven't received it. So if you nominated somebody last year and they didn't get the nomination, you can do it again. Laura, it's Arlene. Can you nominate more than one person? You yes, definitely. Okay. Any other questions, Laura? Sorry, where do we yeah. get that information? Um, that, that well, I it, in the attachments that I emailed everybody. Everybody should have received their own timeline, so you know what's going on. Um, just a copy of the press release just for your information, a copy of um, what they need to personify and all the past recipients and an actual application or nomination paper. So you could print those out and hand them out to your friends. Uh, it will be on the Salt Marsh website. I'm sure that it will get it in current, the INM um, daybreak. Uh, the posters that we have, you know, people can just put their phone up to the the code and nominate right there. And if anybody has any other suggestions of where to get the information out to, I'll take it. I wasn't sure if I got one. I Maybe I should check, uh, make sure I'm on your email list. Well, if you got the Zoom link, you, yeah, the Zoom link came from me. Okay with a bunch of attachments that should have had the agenda, the minutes, and I can send it all again. No, I did I did get that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, brief update on the NHA program. Uh, for those of you just joining us, for the last two years, NHA has had a program called On the Road, where from September through April, May, we take uh, programs on the road to uh, the senior living centers as well as Salt Marsh uh, to bring history and stories to the senior citizens. Um, 
And so uh, Marianne had asked me in the past to just talk about some of the things that we've been finding. Um, April was a um, 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 February was an interesting month because we focused on the Great Fire of 1846 and found the seniors had loads of uh, comments and stories about other fires on the island. It got to be quite a very interesting type discussion about all the different fire hazards on the island and other fires that they knew about. And some of them I've never even heard of. So we continue in March with Women's History Month and we're gonna highlight six or eight prominent Nantucket women. Uh, when we're working in conjunction with uh, the Mariah Mitchell curator to put together a PowerPoint presentation as well as pictures of the artifacts that belong to these women. Okay, any questions before we move on? Believe you're up, Jericho. All right, so this is the um, point of the meeting where I go into a couple of things that I've been up to recently um, and also share what we have in terms of COVID-related information. And then if anyone has any questions that they want um, to ask about anything that the town does or any town business that's confusing them, um, they can ask me here. Um, to start, recently, uh, I've been working with a variety of stakeholders for the Nantica Behavioral Health Initiative. Um, it's, uh, Jason was referring to it in his earlier update, but it's basically a um, alliance of healthcare and mental health providers here on the island um, that are trying to coordinate and tie together um, the various people participate or various organizations participating in it so that we can be more collaborative and more efficient in how we allocate resources. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've been uh, doing the first round of the um, Contract Review Committee's grant awards. Uh, the Contract Review Committee awards between uh, $600,000 and $800,000 a year to human services um, organizations on the island. Uh, this year, I think we have, uh, what was it, 650000 dollars to award to human services programs, and an additional $175,000 that we're awarding to substance abuse programs on the island. Um, the latter is collected from uh, a sales tax on recreational cannabis sales on the island, a percentage of which is applied to human services um, contracts relating to substance abuse. Uh, after that, we I've been working on um, a couple of the uh, Title III grants uh, that uh, Marianne Easley, who is not here today, um, has been working on the Handyman Grant, um, and then um, trying to assist Laura with getting some um, uh, additional computer education through the school. Uh, additionally, I'm planning on doing, sorry, not the, through the school, through the Salt Marsh, apologies. Um, so I think we have a once a month basic computer course that's going on there. Um, and then in addition to that, I go down and do my tech clinics um, once a month or so too, where um, members of the Salt Marsh can bring in a device that is not working. Uh, and I will bang my head against the table until I get it to work. Um, then I'm trying to think what other... Um, and that's, that's the majority of what I've been doing for the last couple of months, um, as well as getting ready for um, the coming fall uh, and uh, helping to support some state-run COVID clinics on the island. Um, as to the COVID situation at the moment, we had our most recent wastewater uh, collection come in earlier today, uh, and I can give a fairly high degree of confidence that we have very comparatively low amounts of COVID right now. Um, the concentration count is about as low as it can be and still be measured, um, which is to be expected since this is the lowest population on the island, um, uh, you know, annually. Um, expect the next two weeks to have a pretty sharp and pronounced increase in the amount of uh, ambient COVID as people return back from vacation. And if you were going to um, wear a mask at any point in the soon future while you're indoors, I would do so starting the week after um, uh, vacation returns, so next week. Uh, additionally, uh, for the next two weeks, uh, or Laura, did I say one week or two weeks, uh, for the mask mandate at the Salt Oh, Marsh. you said to like, um, like the two 20, weeks. yeah, the 21st. Yeah, so yeah. Um, just because we've seen this happen after the previous vacations, we'll do a, a mask mandate during operating hours at the Salt Marsh, um, just to kind of minimize the exposure for the most at-risk people on the island. Uh, past that, that's most of what I've been up to of late. 
Um, does anyone have any questions on anything related to what I said and or questions about um, my position or other stuff you want me to find out about the town? I Anybody? Oh, sure. Well, Laura, <laughs> um, the call's coming from inside the house. Going, are we going specifically definitely to the 21st or are we waiting to see what the wastewater does next week? We're probably going to do two weeks just because the lag in infection to in um, the, the lag between infection and wastewater oh, okay. results. So we won't see the the people actually coming positive and being infectious until a couple of days after the wastewater comes in, at which point it will already have been two weeks. Um, okay. If we have a, a prolonged raise, rise in the wastewater um, uh, concentrations after the two week period, we may keep them up. Uh, but if you don't, you have to put a mask mandate in for at least two weeks, given the incubation period for COVID. Okay. And how often do you do the wastewater? That is being done three times a week now. Oh. Um, we we're doing it once every other week. The state of Massachusetts came in and sponsored us to do it um, significantly more frequently than we were in the past. And we're getting pretty granular data in terms of like, how, you know, uh, how accurately we can predict, you know, how close to real time our measuring of the wastewater is. Um, you know, I think we're about a 72 hour delay between the average measurements, which is um, unimaginable to me uh, six months or a year ago when I had to wait, you know, one a week or one every other week. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from Jericho? Yeah, yeah um, Arlene? Jericho, hi. Um, do you have any um, updates on the Memory Cafe? So we, uh, I believe uh, that the initial tranche of money was collected. Um, we had some, uh, somebody has, uh, Abby, you're gonna have to mute one of those. Hold on, I can get it. Where's it going? Okay, I think we're good. Um, okay. So uh, the we had some um, state funding through a rural vaccine or rural, it was renamed to Rural Health Equity Initiative. So um, we gave them some startup funds to get staffing and locations secured. Um, they should be getting the first step uh, if they are awarded money through CRC, which I am currently unable to tell you um, officially yet. Um, they would be starting operations likely in June or sorry, in July with the start of the new fiscal year, which is when they would receive the grant funding necessary to go to full speed on the um, the update. Uh, I talked to Brian Lane, who's doing some of the behind the scenes stuff on that not too long ago, um, and uh, it is uh, going quite well. Um, I think that they are they anticipate starting when um, when they would. Okay. Laura, your report was distributed to everybody. Um, you want to talk about it a little or? No, nope, it's pretty self-explanatory unless everybody has any questions. Any questions of Laura on her activities report? Laura? Abby, I mean, Arlene. <laughs> um, hi, Laura. Um, on your, your sheet, I think um, the upcoming events section, you might have had some wrong dates in there because you had February dates in there. And I don't oh. know if we need to update that for record keeping. I'm not sure a hundred percent. Do we have to? I don't know the answer to that one, Jericho. Uh, I'm sorry. I got distracted in another window. What was the question? So Laura's um, report had on her future events coming up had incorrect dates. Like it looked like it maybe it was left over from the last report because it had February's dates in it. So I'm oh, assuming you know why? It March. I don't know. Because there was no January meeting. So right. I excluded right. February because otherwise you guys wouldn't have known what happened in February. Right. So I'm but thinking I said upcoming. Right? So I, that's why I was like, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> As, as long as the as long as the minutes are, are are as long as in the minutes it's noted that those were that those are in the past it should be okay I don't think you have any real like the the that would be Laura that was stuff that you had in there uh, this is like the combined packet Correct. for the previous two to three months from the over the January yeah Correct. So as long as when you're doing the minutes, uh, just note that the these these represent the minutes for two months should be good to go. Got it. Okay. Um, 
Do we have a report on the uh, senior home modifications? Did she leave that with either Jericho or Laura? No? Okay, then we'll have she to, uh, then we'll take that up next month. Um, let's see, does anybody have any other business? Anybody? Uh, I want to, um, I believe two members have talked to Mary Ann about perhaps going to live meetings every month and just wanted to take a sense of how do people feel about that coming off of Zoom or I guess we'd have to do it with Zoom. Ken, is it possible to do partially live, partially Zoom? For those that want to be in person and then those that are tight on time, at least from my standpoint, right. on Zoom, it's it's better for for me anyway. So I didn't know if that's from, possible or not. From my side, we do have a pretty well set up hybrid meetings. Uh, our, our, we have a hybrid meeting set up in the trailer next to um, the old fire station. If the members would like to have a hybrid option, um, I, I can probably get something uh, going on that. Uh, as long as we, you know, we have a pretty regular time. Uh, there are two rooms in there. Um, I can just ask to have the meeting scheduled as a hybrid meeting, and then we would run the meeting in person with people who cannot uh, attend in person, zooming in. Okay. Do um, uh, would we take a vote, Jericho, or how? What would be uh, protocol for this? In general, remote or not is determined by the chair. As long as there is an allowance for remote, you can do hybrid. Um, to go mandatory uh, in person, I don't think you can yet. I think you have to okay. allow for some hybrid to it. But if you guys want to do um, a hybrid meeting, it just would be, you know, Bob, it would be basically you and Marianne would figure out um, if you want to do that. You could ask for a vote if you want to, but you are not required to. Um, the only functional difference on a staff end is that when we schedule the meeting, we also ask Erica, Erica to reserve some high, the, the trailer room, uh, one of the two trailer rooms during that time period. And anyone who wants to attend in person can just come in. Can I get some sense about how people feel about uh, having that option of, of both live and, in, um, and the video? I'm fine with that. Yes. I'd be happy to attend live. I'm good with hybrid. Nancy? This gives me much more flexibility if I can do it via Zoom. I'll be honest. And there okay, will well, we have that option still. Yeah. Jude? So, oh. oh, I was just going to say to be just to be uh, to, to fully clarify, the Zoom option will all must be in place. We cannot hold um, in person only. So any offering from Ford will have some degree of Zoom in it. Jude, how do you feel? Uh, well, you're muted, I think. Um, Ab you mean Abby? I'm no. Oh. Well, uh, Jude is trying to turn on her sound. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm flexible. Um, either way, it's fine. Okay. Why don't you just type? It? And from from the chat, she from the chat, she does want to preserve preserve a Zoom option, so the hybrid should work. Sorry, okay. I didn't see I'll that. I'll talk it over with Marianne and we'll let you know uh, how we decide to proceed. Is there any other business that people want to take up? I would entertain a uh, motion to close the meeting. Somebody want to move it? Nancy, I move to close the meeting. Arlene Someone, second it. Arlene seconds it. All in favor? Aaron? Aye. Yes. <laughs> Arlene? Aye. Yes. <laughs> Jude? You can just wave. Jude does. Jude typed yes. Okay. Uh, Abby? Aye. And myself? Aye. So and I Nancy. think. And Nancy, yep. Okay. You all have a good week, and we'll see oh. you next month, unless, unless uh, sooner. One last thing I do, um, just to reiterate, if anybody has any questions about any town business that they would like answered, please feel free to um, email me. Uh, I think I'm on the email for this, uh, your notifications for this. Mm -hmm.
Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.